Welcome to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. This podcast is sponsored by Vantage Circle, the simple and AI-powered rewards and recognition platform for employee engagement. Hi everyone, this is Sushmita from the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. And in today's episode, we are going to discuss about strategic leadership. Yes, so we'll know the definition, we'll know how is it different from the traditional manager's approach, we'll know its pros and cons, Um, we'll know how to encourage and develop it, and uh, we'll also know the role of, you know, uh, creativity, which is very important in organizations today. Uh, We'll also give you some real-life examples of strategic leadership situations, and there are some good suggestions from our speaker as well. Our speaker today is Stephanie Bound who is a business performance specialist, like a personal trainer for businesses. Stephanie works with founders and leaders to improve their leadership fitness. Welcome to the show, Stephanie. Thank you, Shushmita. Thanks for having me. Great. Okay, so before we start with the topic, uh, please uh, brief us about your journey in the corporate world. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here talking to your audience today. Uh, For me, my journey really began a long time ago. I was really clear about what I wanted to do from a very early age, from the age of about 15 years old. And I was sitting down with my uncle who was a psychologist and Mm. uh, I wanted to study psychology. And we'd run a series of kind of psychometric tests for me to uh, confirm that I was, that it was the right choice for me. Um, But he asked me at that point, you know, well, you know that you want to be a psychologist, but all you need to decide now is, whether you want to work with sick people or well people. And I knew straight away that I wanted to work with well people and I wanted to help people towards high performance. So my journey began really as an interest in the corporate world all the way back then when I was when I was 15. And um, so I studied for seven years. Uh, I've got seven years of tertiary education in psychology and neuropsychology. And where I started life in the corporate world was in big, big consulting companies. So PwC for a while and at NAUS Group. But I've worked with literally hundreds of leaders across every, every industry. But probably my most seminal experience was with Swiss Wellness. So they're an Australian-based uh, new pharmaceutical company that produces multivitamins. Oh. And um, I was with them for a number of years from 2014 to 2016. And in that time, that was really where I got to put all of the things I'd learned to the test inside a single organisation and see how they all landed and impacted uh, performance of the business. And so the time that I was there over that three-year period, they grew revenue from $300 million to $750 million. And they actually sold to a Hong Kong-listed company called Biostime for $1.7 billion, which was a landmark transaction at the time. Mm-hmm. So that, that experience gave me a lot of confidence to really start my own consulting practice, which I started in 2014. And my mission is to help individuals and teams find and keep their performance edge. So I've, I've been squarely focused on performance in the corporate world for a long time. Okay, uh, so uh, today's topic is strategic leadership, which I already mentioned. So it is uh, taught to be uh, something that must be learned rather than something that comes naturally, right? So as a result, uh, learning about the mindset and behaviors one wants to represent will help become a better strategic leader. So what are the characteristics of a good uh, strategic leader that you want our listeners to know? I think uh, that would basically cover up what strategic leadership is all about, isn't it? Yeah, look, I completely agree with you. And I think if we're going to be talking about, you know, what is strategic leadership and what do good strategic leaders do, you know, I, I, I start with this idea that well, what is strategy to begin with? So really what strategy is, it, at its most basic form, it's a plan to realising a vision, right? So but what's really interesting about strategy is that um, companies typically only realise about 60% of their strategic plan's potential value. And that's not because strategies are flawed. We often come up with really good strategies and the strategies represent you know, value and growth to organisations, but where we fall down in organisations is in the planning and execution of strategy. So this was a piece of research published in the Harvard Business Review by Mankins and Steele. Mm. So it's not just enough to have a plan. We need is strategic leadership. And what strategic leadership is about is actually about harnessing the collective intelligence of teams to align on a plan and execute with confidence. And strategic leadership, I, I talk about it in terms of it's, it's leaders putting in place strategy systems. So it's your process 
for strategy creation and strategy execution Mm -hmm. that enables your organisation to remain adaptive in your chosen market but really realise the full value of your strategic plan. And strategy systems, strategic leadership is about putting these leaders, these systems for strategy in place. And what this does, what a strategy system does, is it fuels performance and it fuels growth by ensuring that all team members set and are accountable to results. So strategic leadership really is about that. It's putting in place a process where teams align on goals and work together to achieve goals and creating a system for that so that it's perpetual. You know, it happens on and on. It's an ongoing process within an organisation. So I think strategic leadership is a series, it's a mindset that leaders adopt and it's also a set of habits and behaviours that leaders adopt. Right, right, great. So, uh, okay, so what are the key things that uh, strategic leaders do consistently well? Yeah, so if we're going to talk about strategic leadership as a set of behaviours and a mindset, you know, it really is, it's, it's a verb, it's a doing word. It's something that you do. So there are, there are three things that strategic leaders do consistently well and they perpetuate these things in an ongoing manner. So they create clear and, and actionable strategy to begin with. Mm. So we can't execute a plan if we don't have a plan. So they create strategies that are super simple, super clear, so that they are actionable. People understand what they are being asked to deliver in support of an organisation's purpose. So that's the first thing that strategic leaders do. Um, The second is that they cascade and align teams. So they're constantly working and aligning teams to work collaboratively together in the pursuit of a goal for an organisation. And they do this systematically by creating really consistent habits and patterns in an organisation. It could be a quarterly team meeting, a team planning meeting where teams get together and they review their progress against their goals or it could be monthly individual sessions where leaders get together with their people and they talk about individual goals and how individuals are going in performance of their goals. But they're cascading, they're taking the big picture goal and they're breaking it down into sub goals at a team level, at an individual level, and they're really helping individuals understand how what they do is relevant to the business. So that's the second thing that they do. And the third thing that they that they do consistently well is that they review and evaluate performance. So they're constantly looking at what is the impact of our work. If we're going to hit a goal, what's the measure of performance of our goal? How do we know if we're tracking well or not well in relation to a goal? So they create uh, a system or a process for reporting and reviewing results. So what happens when they do these three things really well? They create clear and actionable strategy and they cascade and align teams and they evaluate and review performance is they're implementing a strategy system and it takes strategy from being kind of in people's heads or outdated to ongoing, clear and actionable and relevant. And that's what creates alignment and allows teams to work together in pursuit of common goals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, uh, do you believe that uh, strategic leadership is uh, better than traditional manager's approach? Yeah, look, I think this is a really interesting question, Shushmita, because it makes me think about, well, what is traditional management? And when I think about traditional management, I think about command and control, hierarchical styles of management, which were prevalent in the industrialised era. Basically, uh, it was about authoritative uh, leadership, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. You know, and in those styles of organisations, and they, they still exist now, but what happens is in traditional management is that strategic thinking and creativity and innovation happens at the top of the organisational tree and the doing and the execution happens at the bottom of the organisational tree. Mm. So we separate, they separate strategic thinking from execution. Um, and this, this approach works only in really standardised organisations where repetitiveness is a must. So think about McDonald's, for example. It only works if workers follow very specific standards to produce products that look and taste the same anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. That's exactly what McDonald's customers want. They want the same product no matter where they go. So you don't want workers in McDonald's inventing new ways to make the filet fish better, would you? You just want them to do the same thing over and over again. So where I think that works, you know, the, the issue with that style of management, that traditional style of management, is that we're seeing an increase, a rapid increase in artificial intelligence and automation. 
And that means that those jobs where the, the standardised jobs are shrinking and, in fact, the World Economic Future of um, the World Economic Forum produces a future of jobs report every year and they state that by 2025 the number of work tasks performed by humans and machines is going to be equal for the first time in human history, which I think is a pretty astounding statistic, to be honest with you. So what that's telling us is that where things can be automated, they will be. And this is all going to, this change is going to accelerate over the next five years. Mm. So I think traditional management where we separate strategic thinking from execution is, is going to become outdated very soon. And in fact, the top skills for the next five years, they're really all about strategic leadership. The Future of Jobs report reported things like analytical thinking and innovation, active learning and learning strategies, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, you know, creativity, originality. These are all things that require strategic leadership. Mm. So I think the pros of having okay. strategic leaders in a business is really that they are adopting these skills, but they're also actively encouraging everyone in the business to use their skills. They're asking everybody to think strategically about how they actually deliver their work. Um, and it doesn't matter where they sit in an organisational hierarchy. Really what we want is strategic leaders to encourage strategic ways of adapting everywhere in an organisation. And this is going to help organisations on two major fronts. So the first is that it's going to ensure that businesses and organisations stay ahead of the change curve and adapt and respond according to their market. Um, you know, McDonald's is in a stable market, but pretty much, you know, that there aren't very many organisations that don't need to continuously adapt and evolve in order to stay relevant. But the second thing um, that having strategic leaders does for organisations is that it, it encourages, it develops the skills in people to help them stay relevant so that they don't become irrelevant with skills that machines will soon be able to do. Right. You right. know, I mean, can you imagine working in a world where fast food is going to be served by robots and where right. buses and trains and planes are driven by AI? You know, that, that world isn't far off. So strategic leaders are looking ahead. They're seeing these risks. They're activating intelligence in people around them. And they're asking themselves and the people around them to solve problems to and you know solve problems and find solutions to things that we've never been ha had to deal with before. So strategic leadership is an absolute necessity in this constantly changing and dynamically evolving world that we live in. So basically, they are working to make work smarter rather than you know harder, right? Correct, work smarter, but also to adapt to the changing market and this dynamic marketplace that we live in, and find new ways of be being relevant and. Um, you know, recognising that that thinking, we, we don't want to devolve thinking um, to just the people at the top of the tree. We want everyone in organisations to think and come up with new ideas and be able to respond effectively to whatever challenges in the market presents to us at any given day. Okay, but like almost everything else, Stephanie, strategic leadership is also not something without flaws, right? Uh, it would be great if you uh, can highlight the weaknesses of strategic leadership now, leadership here. Yeah, I, I love this question. Mm -hmm. I think we need to look at both the light and the dark side of everything, right. don't we? Um, look, I think if anything, strategic leaders they focus on goals and results and thinking ahead and planning and prioritising and coming up with new ways to solve existing challenges. So if anything, they probably they could be um, at risk of over-focusing on results and not thinking about people. So strategy is really important. Strategy drives performance, but it's not the only equation to driving high-performance organisations. And in fact, I think there are two other key ingredients and they're culture and leadership. Culture is really important because culture drives passion. Culture fuels passion by connecting people to shared systems of values and beliefs. And leaders are super important because leaders drive purpose. They connect people to their purpose in the organisation and they develop the capability of people to achieve. So strategic leadership is great in that it drives performance, but where strategic leaders could miss a beat is thinking about culture and, um, and, and how to enable and develop people to achieve outcomes. Mm -hmm. So what we want to see is those three things working together because when they work together, they actually generate 
uh, you know, incredible performance. They drive high-performance organisations. And, in fact, there's a system for each of them. There's a system for strategy. There's a system for culture. There's a system for leadership. And strategic leaders are all about creating uh, strategy systems. So um, where they need to think about applying their, their knowledge and their skills is in also how do we create the system for culture and how do we actually lead in systematic ways also. Um, but I really like to think about a strengths-based approach to this. So if you're a strategic leader and your strength is in planning, organising, thinking ahead, coming up with different ways of doing things, um, you know, don't focus on your gaps. So don't sort of the strengths-based mindset is don't fix a weakness, amplify a strength. So if you're a strategic leader, what I'd suggest you do is really find partner with people who are all about driving culture or all about exceptional leadership. So get those people in your team, create a team of complementary strengths um, and, you know, continue to develop your strengths as a strategic leader and lean into people who are, are about um, culture and personal development, professional development of others at work and ask them to help you execute with, um, you know, I mean, a very coordinate, coordinated approach between all of you. Yeah, I really love that answer, Stephanie. So with this, there are also a couple of other things that come up, you know, uh, one of them being the uh, decision-making factor. So uh, mm. many corporate leaders fail as a result of poor decisions, you know, made in their positions. So undoubtedly, they uh, they must embrace the importance of good decision-making, isn't it? Mm. So having said that, um, as a strategic leader, what are the most critical decisions, you know, one can make? Yeah, it's a really good question as well. Look, I think because strategic leaders are so focused on achieving goals and achieving visions, um, their worst mistake could possibly be setting the wrong goals. So how you set a goal, the strategic leaders really, they're all about setting goals and targets that that actually determines how everybody else in the business prioritises their time. So if we don't have the right goals in place, then we're not prioritising our time and effort effectively. So wrong goals equal wasted effort, which drives poor performance. So when strategic thinker lead, leaders are thinking about setting goals, what they need to think about is how they set goals across three different focus areas. So they want to they want to achieve set you know essentially we want to achieve self set goals. We want to set goals that enable us to perform to our ex expected standards, but we also want to be looking at how are we adapting to the market? So the market shifts and changes. And if we're just, we just keep setting goals according to our own standards each year and we're not looking outside of the organisation, then what happens is we start losing touch with the reality of the market. So um, strategic leaders need to set goals for their own teams and their own organisations, but they also need to set goals in relation to their competitors and really understand what are their customers asking for. And then I think the third thing that strategic leaders really need to think about is how do we actually not just adapt but disrupt? And the companies that seek to disrupt tend to be the ones that we remember in history. There's some really good examples of these companies are, you know, Netflix. Netflix has completely disrupted, disrupted the, uh, the, the market with their on-demand streaming. And, you know, the, the, what happened to their competitor, Blockbuster, who didn't adapt, they only set self-set goals, they didn't bother looking outside of their organisation, really seeing what was happening in the market. So Blockbuster became irrelevant and Netflix has really charged forward. Mm -hmm. um, you know, another example is obviously Apple. You know, Apple created touch screen, touch screen technology and that disrupted the entire mobile market and, in fact, BlackBerry, who had their touch-type keyboards, became irrelevant. So as a strategic leader, you need to be thinking about not just adaptation to market but disruption of market and what can you actually do to change the nature of the game. And they tend to be the companies that really evolve and, you know, catch our eye and stay on our lips. Right. Okay. So um, how to encourage and develop an overall strategic thinking organisation? Yeah, I think this is a really important one to consider because what we don't want to do is conform to outdated models of leadership, hierarchical, standardised, industrialised notions of, of, of leadership where strategic thinking happens at the top and everybody else just does what we tell them to do. What we want is for everybody to adopt 
strategic thinking capabilities and to really think about how they can do their jobs. You know, you said it works smarter, not harder, and continue to involve the way that we're doing things. So um, to encourage a strategic thinking organisation, I think there's two things leaders can do. It's inclusion in the strategy creation process. So, um, and, and this happens as a cascade model. So let's imagine an executive leadership team get together on an annual basis to uh, reset the, the business's goals and priorities in relation to, let's say, a five-year vision or a five-year plan. And they release a document to say, okay, well, here are our new goals and targets for the year. Well, then what needs to happen is that the executive of operations team, for example, needs to get his team together mm. and they all need to go through that same process. They need to look at what the organisational goals are and say, well, what are our, what are our operational team's goals and what are our operational team's targets and how are we going to work together this year to achieve what the organisation is asking us to and so on and so forth. And then the operational team needs to get his logistics crew together and they do the same process. So it's involvement in that creation of what are our goals and targets so that every person feels a sense of buy-in and accountability to the overall. Mm. Um, so I think that's really important. I think that's missed. I think executive teams come out with a plan and they publish it and then they just expect everybody to set their own individual um, plans in accordance to that plan. But there hasn't been that step in the middle where everybody aligns as a team on what it is we're going to work together to do. And I think the other thing is to kind of build a strategic mindset in the organisation. So to adopt a 80-20 rule. So it's not just about sort of getting together in teams and having these stress, these sessions, but it's, it's living by 80-20 where 20% is strategy creation and 80% is strategy execution. You know, everybody needs 20% time in their week, in their month, in their year to actually get engaged in planning and thinking about how they do their work. Right. So, um, three, you know, have you probably heard of 3M and they're, um, you know, they produce the post-it notes, but 3M are really famous for their 15% time. You know, they had, um, they say to everyone in their business, we want you to spend 15% of your time to innovation. And the post-it note was born of 15% time. And in fact, Google uses 20% time, you know, Google's, Google Maps and Gmail were born of 20% time. So what we actually want is to create a mindset where everybody needs to step up and spend about 20, 15 to 20% of their time on thinking and planning and being strategic about how they do their work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so rightly mentioned, uh, Stephanie, that, uh, it, you know, uh, strategic thinking, it consists of, you know, basically three uh, phases uh, that I, I mm. say that uh, where we are now, where we want to be and how we'll get there, right? So yeah. for this, we need certain components to be in place and, and that might range from tools uh, for analysis, some action planning, a purpose, a strong vision, and most importantly, I believe in having strong core values, right? So what mm. are your thoughts on the importance of core values in strategic leadership? How do you make sure that uh, your company and its actions are in line with them? Yeah, I think values are absolutely core. They they sit at the heart of an organisation and they influence how we go about working together in the pursuit of our purpose. So if our strategy determines what we're going to work on to achieve our purpose, our values determine how we're going to work together, how we want people to behave when working together. Um, and we want our values to be meaningful. So um, that it's not enough to have a set of values and post it on the website or put them on the wall um, and essentially what we're doing is paying them lip service. What we actually need to do is embed values in the way that we actually work. So strategic leaders really think about values in relation to decisions that they are making when it comes to deciding on what we're going to work on. You know, they think about if we, if we need to make a choice about where we're going to prioritise our efforts, what are our values telling us is, you know, what is living respect, what is living integrity, if we're living these values, how does that determine where we focus our efforts and energies this year? You know, for a lot of organisations throughout COVID, it has meant either scaling down their expectations of people um, so that they can actually enable people to adapt to working from home. It's ensuring that people have the right support systems in place, that they're, that they're clear on the work that they've got, they've got the tools that they need. So it may have meant that they needed to slow down for a while before they sped up again. And that determines how they want to work together. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's partly about using your values as, 
as a kind of benchmark against which how you make decisions about what you're going to work on and what pace you're going to work as an organisation. And I also think it's a little bit about saying, well, how are we going to live our values in the way that we deal with people? Mm -hmm. So I talk a little bit about uh, the culture system and how to create a plan that is really all about how you live your values at each stage of the employee life cycle. And it's your commitment. It's your company's commitment to living your values. And it's it's simply a plan, a culture plan. It would take as much um, meaning, it would have as much emphasis in a business as a business plan. They need to work together because people can't achieve the objectives objectives of an organisation unless they're enabled to do so. So the culture plan is how we live our values in the way that we deal with people so we can really support and enable them to be the best versions of themselves so they can perform to the standard that we need them to. And these two things play off each other. So values are absolutely important both in um, how in influencing the decisions you make about what you're going to focus your time on but also in how you actively work with and develop and support your people so that they can achieve your company's goals. Right. Yeah. So again, um, along with, uh, you know, as you mentioned, planning and uh, you know, strategies, uh, uh, creativity is no longer an optional in uh, organizations mm. today. In fact, people are seeing that creative thinking is the only business strategy that we need now. So it would mm. be fantastic if you could provide a few fast tactics for sharpening, you know, creative juices and strategic leadership. Mm. <laughs> I totally agree with this. I think creativity is no longer an option. And in fact, it was listed as one of the top five skills uh, required in the next five years by the Future of Jobs report. I think creative thinking is um, you know, a way to do this, a tactic for this is to inspire your team. So, you know, when your le- leaders who inspire are leaders who see potential they see, a, a, they have a vision and they paint the picture of their vision to their team. So a great way to stimulate creative thinking is to get teams together. And before you sort of jump in on, okay, well, what are our goals? What are our targets? You know, sort of the hardcore heavy hitting conversations, just step back a little bit and say, well, what, you know, what do we all believe is really possible here? You know, what is our vision? What is our purpose? What do we exist here to do for our company, for our community? You know, what's really important to us? And when you open up different sorts of questions, that stimulates different kinds of thinking about how we want to work together to pursue our company purpose and, and realise our potential. Mm-hmm. You know, the example that I have here is that um, if you, let's say, for example, your organisation exists to, um, to stimulate uh, innovation and creativity in the way that we deal with customers, So a a people and culture team, if they got together and and were asked to come up with a business plan or a strategic plan, I'd encourage them to first sit down and consider why do they exist? What's the purpose of a people and culture team? And some answers to that could be that they exist to create the conditions where people can thrive or they exist to create the conditions where people can turn up to be the best versions of themselves at work. So people and culture teams are responsible for putting in place the systems and the processes that enable and in, that enable people, that empower people, that support people to perform to their best. And if, if people and culture team can rally around that, then they're going to start thinking very differently and, and hopefully more creatively about how they go about doing their work and really question the status quo, question what's been done, question the way they're doing things without fear of, you know, um, potentially a, attack or retribution or having a crack at, at any ideas before. It's really not about that. It's about actually just saying, okay, well, we've done it this way, what's a different way, what's a new way we can work together that will make our jobs more enjoyable but also enable us to deliver a better product to our customers, whether they be internal customers or external customers. Right, yeah. Uh, So, Stephanie, you have already uh, given some examples from McDonald's and Netflix, but uh, is there any other, uh, you know, example from the real life of strategic leadership situations that you want to uh, see today? Oh, shush, Meta, there are so many examples of strategic leadership situations. Um, I think that um, there's probably a couple of, you know, quick ones that we've all seen through COVID, you know, people who very quickly pivoted their approaches. So, alcohol, you know, distilleries of gin and whiskey producing hand sanitizer, for example, you know, they quickly saw a change in the market and they used their existing resources to produce a new product that was going to enable them to survive through a very tough period. 
um, you know, fashion houses producing personal protective equipment. We saw restaurants suddenly turning into home delivery services. You know, so we saw a lot of change uh, occur through COVID. Companies, little businesses, large and small, all coming up with new ways to keep their people working and produce products and services that the market needed, which I thought was really, really creative. But I think a couple of sort of bigger ones that I wanted to shout out um, here is, you know, from a personal experience, so when I worked at Swiss Wellness, which I mentioned at the start of the call, um, one of the things that really led to their success was pivoting their sales channel. So typically Swiss Wellness, they sold multivitamins through retailers, large retailers like chemists and supermarkets. But what they were noticing was that there were, they, they, they discovered these daigus. So daigus are like, online online shoppers who buy and sell across borders and they noticed these diagos were starting to sell buy and sell in the Chinese market so they were just you know small single operator people just buying up products from a chemist and selling it across to China and what this um, channel allowed was really a fast track movement from Australian based products to China without having to go through all the usual cross-border restrictions so what Swiss decided to do was really feed those channels, feed those digos, those cross-border resellers, which was a huge market disruption at the time. But what this did was create access for Swiss products in the Chinese market. It, it grow, grew the brand in a huge market. It elevated its market value. Um, and what that ultimately did was attract a Chinese buyer and, you know, create an, ex, an extremely strong sell price for that business. It was a record sale um, at the time. So that was one example of of a pivot, a strategic leadership pivot. But I think another example that I really admire is another Australian brand called Kogan. So Kogan.com, they are a branch that launched, a brand that launched as a manufacturer of electronics and white goods. Mm -hmm. And they, um, what they realised though was to kind of, you know, contract the manufacturer of a, um, you know, a white good like a fridge, for example, and then, you know, to pay for that that actual development of that product but then sell it in an Australian market. You know, that that time, was a, that was a good sort of seven, eight, sometimes 12 weeks. So what that did was limit cash flow in the business and they knew they needed cash reserves to grow. So what they did was to build cash reserves was to become a reseller of electronic goods and white goods. So um, for brands such as Samsung, they, you know, Hewlett Packard, et cetera. So they became a reseller of these other goods. And not only did they become a reseller, they also found ways to offer the most competitive prices in Australia by buying those goods from those, from contract manufacturers overseas at much lower prices. So they were able to very quickly generate the cash reserves they needed to continue to grow their own branded, branded goods. But in addition to that, they created, you know, additional revenue channels by branding by becoming wholesaler wholesalers of services so they created Kogan Mobile Kogan Insurance um, and they did this through partnerships of resellers such as Optus you know so it was really just a very clever strategic leadership opportunity where the leaders of that business kept asking questions about how can we grow our cash flow how can we get better prices what are other ways we can wholesale And they create all of these fantastic opportunities and they're they're one of the fastest growing businesses in Australia at the moment. So I think, you know, strategic leadership really is about looking at your market, looking at the way that you operate and constantly asking these questions of yourself, of your people to keep coming up with great ideas so that you can remain adaptive and responsive in your market. Mm -hmm. amazing examples thanks for sharing this stephanie so uh, yeah so what would be your suggestions to the leaders listening to uh, to us now look i think it's you know there's there's probably four things don't wait to be can be given permission from the powers that be to be a strategic leader it's a choice that you make with how you use your time so think 80 20 Think, you know, adapting 20% of your time to reviewing and planning and asking yourself strategic th- uh, strategic questions and 80% to getting stuff done, to executing. But, but keep yourself uh, disciplined about how you use your time. I think the second thing is get your team together to think creatively together. So schedule a quarterly catch up with your team. Ask them these questions. Set goals together. Set KPIs. 
and look at your achievements and celebrate your achievements as a group, but make this a quarterly thing, you know, book it a year out in everyone's calendars and everything else just gets arranged around these sessions. And then you create this this expectation that we're all going to get back together and look at how we track and we're going to think about how we work. And that creates an operating rhythm that everybody starts to align with. So create these times in your diary for, for thinking, for your team to get together and have, do it as well. Um, I think it's important to set goals. You definitely set a goal, but make sure that your goals are measurable. So don't just set a goal that is open, open-ended. It has to be tangible. It has to be measurable so that people know if they have or haven't achieved things. And it's not so much about have you... Uh, you know, have you achieved a goal or not? So much comes from the learning of not achieving a goal, for example. So if we haven't, let's understand why. What were the things that got in the way? Was it the wrong goal? You know, what are some things we can learn from the challenge of, of seeking and achieving a goal? And then the last thing is look for inspiration. So look for inspiration in your market. Dream about what's possible. Look for the potential in your business. Ask yourself how you can't just adapt, ask yourself how you can disrupt. And those are the ways you can continue to really push elevation and growth and regeneration and really exciting opportunities through your whole organization. Okay, brilliant. So finally, uh, Stephanie, how can our listeners reach out to you? You can reach out to me on my website. So that's stephaniebown.com. Stephanie is spelt with a P-H. And it's Stephanie Bound, not Brown. I often get that. People go, I can't find you. And I said, did you write Brown or Bound? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's stephaniebound, B-O-W-N.com. So you can find me on my website. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Or you can email me at stephanie at stephaniebound.com. Okay. Uh, thanks for that. So um, that was really a nice conversation, a great conversation, in fact, with you, Stephanie. Thanks a lot for joining me in the Vantage HR Influencers podcast. Thank you so much, Shishmita, and thank you also to your listeners. Thanks for listening to the Vantage HR Influencers Podcast. Please do subscribe to Vantage HR Influencers Podcast on Apple Podcast, Spotify, and our YouTube channel for new episodes.